Good morning. This is a courtesy announcement that this meeting is now being streamed live on the internet. Good morning, Doug. Good morning, Jill. How are you? I'm well, thank you. We can hear you. Super. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Akila. Oh, you're muted. Did you want to do another mic check? Oh, good, mo good morning. Yes, good morning. We can hear you. Thank you. Hello, Tom. Good morning. Yep. Hold on. There we go. How are you? How's my sound? Great. Loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Good morning, Chairperson Simidian. Good morning. With whom am I speaking? This is Jill, but your clerk today would be Dave Leon. All right. Thank you both. We'll go ahead and start in a minute. And um, I see that uh, Supervisor Lee's uh, place is on the screen. So uh, I think we're ready to call the roll promptly at 10 o'clock. And Recording in progress. Good morning, Mr. Chair. It's now 10 o'clock, so whenever you're ready, sir. Thank you very much, Dave. All right, good morning, everyone. This is County Supervisor Joe Simidian, and I am uh, happy to welcome you to uh, our Federal Affairs Advocacy Task Force, uh, which I chair and which uh, my colleague, Supervisor Otto Lee, uh, serves as vice chair on. Uh, and so the first item of business is to call the meeting to order, and we will do that. And we'll ask the clerk to call the roll and establish the presence of a quorum just for the record. Good morning, Vice Chairperson Lee. Good morning, present. And Chairperson Simidian. Present. Uh, Thank both you. Are present and accounted for. That means the call to order has been completed. We have a quorum. It takes us to item number two, which is public comment. Let me turn to the clerk and ask uh, uh, the clerk if we have anyone uh, in uh, lined up to speak under public comment. We have no public speakers, Mr. Chair. All right, that takes us to the consent calendar. 
anyone uh, wishing to speak to the uh, board on the, excuse me, the committee, all right, third time's a charm, task force uh, on the consent calendar, uh, looking to the clerk for uh, information there. No speakers on this item, sir. All right. Uh, the only two items on the consent calendar today, Supervisor Lee, as you can see, are the uh, minutes from prior meetings. Are you prepared to move approval of the consent calendar as contained in the published agenda? Definitely. So moved. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll second. And just for the record, uh, let's ask the clerk to call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Thank you. The calendar is approved. Thank you very much. That uh, takes us now to the heart of our regular agenda and Supervisor Lee. Uh, kind of a mixed bag here today because we have what would on paper look to be a brief uh, agenda, but as you uh, know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll wager um, a lot going on on the federal front that we want to hear about today, notwithstanding what uh, looks like a relatively brief agenda. So um, really looking forward to hearing uh, what uh, our uh, staff and our consultants think uh, the state of affairs might be and what the implications are for the county. Uh, on item four, we typically receive verbal reports, if any, from the chair and vice chair relating to items of interest to the task force. I have no report uh, for uh, our task force today. Anything you would like to share at this point, uh, Supervisor Lee? Yeah, I just want to, uh, I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about the, uh, <clears throat> the I guess, the new buy, uh, Build Back Better, uh, or now called the Inflation uh, <laughs> a Reduction Act uh, later on. Uh, which uh, one thing is clearly uh, uh, missing, and that was basically the two years of universal uh, preschool that was discussed uh, way back. Uh, and I just would like to see if it's possible for this committee to uh, have some visibility on this issue moving forward, because obviously it's still very important. Uh, and the fact that I just learned uh, a few weeks ago that New Mexico actually has uh, provided a one-year program to uh, do something similar. So I certainly would like to see if this is something that this committee could uh, put uh, some um, um, research on to monitor some of these uh, developments. Supervisor Lee, uh, thank you. Um, uh, I think uh, notable and uh, helpful observation. Um, a couple of possibilities here, uh, just uh, as a matter of process, uh, and, um, uh, you and I could talk this one through in real time. Um, as you may or may not recall, uh, the state has taken action to take the existing transitional kindergarten program, which provides a year of transitional kindergarten prior to kindergarten, mm -hmm. uh, taught by certificated staff to what are known as young fives, four-year-olds with uh, birthdays that make them young fives. And uh, beginning this uh, calendar year, excuse me, this uh, school year, rather, this academic year, uh, that program will now be expanded from serving roughly a quarter of the youngsters in California uh, at that age uh, over a phased-in period to cover all of them, uh, and that's by virtue of the resources availability at the state and also uh, the fact that TK um, and I'm somewhat biased, uh, the fact that TK has proven itself uh, over this last decade. Um, if you would like, uh, it occurs to me, we might agendize both um, what did and didn't happen as a separate topic at, uh, in terms of federal action at our next meeting of this task force and supplement that with a report on the extent to which efforts to expand transitional kindergarten will or won't take up the slack. Does that sound like it would be uh, responsive to your interests? Yes, definitely. I think that's exactly how that should work. So thank you for that suggestion. All right. Well, then uh, I know we have uh, staff from your office and my office and the clerk's office uh, all here, uh, as well as our uh, government affairs uh, team. So we'll plan to make that an agendized item, uh, as I say, and see how the two pieces do or don't fit together. Forgive my virtual PowerPoint there, okay? Um, anything else under item four? Uh, and then that's all I have. Thank you very much. All right. Then, without objection and hearing none, we will deem the uh, report verbal reports received. Let me just confirm with the clerk that there were no members of the public for that item. That is confirmed, sir. All right. 
Then uh, let's ask our uh, team here to uh, move us to item number five here from the County Council's office. And uh, is Mr. Press with us today? Yes, good morning, Chairperson Sumidian and Vice Chairperson Lee. Um, uh, I'm here, of course, and then also from my office, my colleague, Deputy County Counsel Rachel Neal, is also joining. Uh, she is going. She has been working on many of the Dobbs-related issues, so she is going to present um, on on those matters, and then I will um, also give, as requested, a brief update on where we are with the Title IX proposed rules. All right. Let's hear from Ms. Neal then. Thank you, Supervisor Smidian. Good morning, Supervisors. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Rachel Neal, and I'm a Deputy County Counsel in the Office of the County Council. Um, and I'll start by providing a brief overview of the Dobbs decision and then discuss related developments and activities. In June of this year, in June of this year the United Forgive States- Forgive me, Ms. Neal. We're, we're getting some scratchiness on your uh, audio. Anything you can do to uh, alleviate that? Is this any better? Uh, if anything, I thought it got a little bit worse. Supervisor Lee, are you having the same experience I am? Yeah, I yes, see. Yes, I'm hearing you too, Craig. Um, let's see. Now, Ms. Neal, uh, take your time here. Uh, you know, we're two years into COVID. We're all used to these tech challenges. So just uh, <laughs> give it a thought and figure out what you'd like to try, and we'll we'll bear with it. Don't worry about it. All right. Um, I... I do wonder if it's just the microphone because I'm not sure that what else could be causing the scratchiness on my end. Um, can you go okay. without the mic? Uh, I can try that. Mr. Press, duly noted that you're now tech support as well. Thank you. <laughs> Other duties as assigned, 5%. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, just attempting to switch to um, off of the headset. Is this any clearer? You're a little muffled, but at least we don't have the scratchiness. Supervisor Lee, I would say this is preferable to what we had a minute ago, yes? Definitely, yes. Okay. All right. Go right ahead. Right. No, thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so I will I'll start by giving a brief overview of the Dobbs decision. Um, in June of this year, the, the U.S. Supreme Court issued its decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. As I'm sure you know, that decision overturned Roe v. Wade and ruled that the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution does not protect the right to abortion because the right is not, quote, deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition, close quote. Under Dobbs, legal standard going forward for assessing whether a restriction on abortion violates the 14th Amendment is more lenient than, more lenient than it was under Roe in the cases that followed Roe. Going forward, abortion restrictions will generally be subject to rational basis review, under which restrictions will typically be upheld if it bears a rational relationship to a legitimate state interest. And the Supreme Court stated in its decision that, quote, the preservation of prenatal life at all stages of development, close quote, is a legitimate interest that can sustain a restriction on abortion. The Supreme Court found that the Mississippi statute at issue in Dobbs, which banned abortion after 15 weeks with limited exceptions, satisfied the standard, the standard and therefore did not violate the 14th Amendment. However, because the Mississippi statute included exceptions for medical emergencies in cases of severe fetal abnormality, the decision left open the question of whether a statute that prohibits abortion in all cases would be constitutional. Um, in addition to summarizing the majority opinion, I also want to briefly discuss the Kavanaugh and Tom's concurrences, because uh, um, I think those provide some in, you know, important sort of clues about what's going on with the court as well. In Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence, he stated that in his view, it would be unconstitutional for a state to prohibit residents from traveling to another state to seek an abortion. Justice Kavanaugh also asserted that the court's decision to overturn Roe does not call into question the continued validity of other civil rights cases grounded in the 14th Amendment due process clause. 
By contrast, Justice Thomas's concurrence called for the Supreme Court to overrule other civil rights decisions grounded in the 14th Amendment due process clause, including those protecting same-sex marriage, same-sex intimacy, and access to contraception. So as I'm sure you're aware, since the Dobb decision, a number of state laws that seek to restrict abortion access have gone into effect. Many of these laws ban abortion from the moment of conception. However, a few have either six or 15 week windows where abortion can be obtained for any reason. All of these laws so far include exceptions that permit abortion where necessary to save the life of the pregnant individual. However, many of the laws do not contain exceptions to protect the health of the individual or for cases where the pregnancy was a result of rape or incest. Um, to provide a bit more background, these laws mostly fall into three categories. The first category is laws that predated Roe v. Wade and were enjoined while Roe was in effect. Another category is the so-called trigger bans, which were passed by state legislatures and set to go into effect in the event Roe was overturned. And then another category are laws that were passed after Roe and had been enjoined because they ran afoul of Roe. Um, several of these laws are being currently challenged. Some abortion rights activists have challenged the laws that predated Roe by arguing that these laws were essentially nullified by the Roe decision back in 1973. Um, other advocates are challenging abortion restrictions by arguing that they violate the applicable state constitutions, um, some of which include rights to privacy that, that have been held to form a basis for a right to abortion. And finally, the federal government recently filed a lawsuit against Idaho arguing that the state's expansive ban on abortion, which does not include an exception for the health of the pregnant individual, is preempted by the Federal Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, to the extent the Idaho law prohibits abortion even when necessary to stabilize a patient who is experiencing a medical emergency. Um, in the wake of Dobbs and increasing restrictions on abortion access, the county also has taken and is taking steps to preserve and protect the right to abortion. Most recently, the Board of Supervisors approved a support position for California Proposition 1, which if passed by voters in November, will amend the California Constitution to expressly establish the right to abortion under the Constitution. In addition, on August 30th, the Board will consider an amendment to the County Ordinance Code that, with limited exceptions, will prohibit the county departments from providing information or using county resources to invest to assist investigations initiated by other governments that seek to impose liability or professional sanctions for the provision or receipt of reproductive health care services that are legal in California. Uh, county Council is also closely monitoring new and ongoing litigation for opportunities to contribute as Michi or otherwise to make a positive impact on the development of the law uh, in a manner consistent with the board's policy directives. Um, many of these, the litigation is very, is very much in the early stages right now. Um, however, we are keeping a close eye on it and looking for opportunities to, to have, a, have an impact. Um, with that, I will conclude my presentation and I am available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a couple of questions uh, and comments, but I'm going to go first to uh, Supervisor Lee, uh, except to say before I uh, defer to my colleague, um, I, I don't think we have uh, much, if any, public participation today. As I look at the list of participants, uh, it looks like it's a, a, a group of our professionals and county uh, folks, uh, along with uh, Mr. Pike from uh, Congressman Rokana's office, who we always appreciate. Uh, but I, I do think it bears repeating that our board has been very clear on the record uh, and uh, unanimously, all five members uh, repeatedly expressing uh, the uh, formal position of our county uh, to support reproductive rights throughout the county. Uh, and as I say, um, that's been a repeated, consistent and unanimous um, uh, policy position taken by our board. Supervisor Lee, I do have a couple of questions, but why don't I start with you? Thank you, um, Supervisor um, Chair Samidian. Um, on the Dobbs decision, certainly it was one of those uh, uh, earthquake landmark decision that came out and even when it was leaked out, that certainly has caused a lot of uh, uh, concerns by millions of uh, Americans, not just women, but every American. Uh, given the long-held tradition of half a century of uh, women's reproductive rights granted 
by uh, from Roe v. Wade in 1973. Um, what I guess I find interesting is that uh, even though it's technically a 6-3 decision uh, on the very issue on Roe, uh, the overturning of Roe, there were barely only five justices that went with that. Am I correct? Yes, the majority opinion uh, was uh, on behalf of five justices. Chief, Chief Justice Roberts concurred in the judgment only, but did not join the majority opinion. Right. So in terms of the issue of overruling role, and I mean, it it's almost seems like a ping pong where, let's say, if there were going to be a change on the makeup of Supreme Court, let's say one of the more conservative justices uh, uh, were to retire, uh, under whatever circumstances might be, uh, and, and the uh, more uh, open-minded justice get get appointed, is it possible that this whole Roe v. Wade could just go back and, and back to the 1973 uh, decision? Because it looks like, I mean, the whole stare decisis, uh, which supposedly is the, the concept, seems to be thrown out the window. Well, so I think it's always difficult to predict um, how changes in the makeup of the court could affect the, some of these very um, controversial issues at some point in the future? Is it possible that 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 the that you know Roe v. Wade or something similar to it would become the law of the land? It's possible, but I think at this stage, um, it would be be difficult to say conclusively if or when that might occur. Sure. I mean, nobody could predict who is going to retire. Um, so <clears throat> now, uh, second thing is, is, as we discussed yesterday in our board meeting, uh, we have a very strong unanimous support of Proposition 1, uh, which, of course, is the uh, reaffirming the constitutional rights of uh, you know, women to obtain the reproductive service here of abortion in, in California. Um, certainly, that's uh, something that I'm, I'm fairly certain would pass uh, uh, in, in, our, in our upcoming election. Uh, and, and even regardless of that outcome, um, our county certainly has taken, as uh, Chair Sumidian has mentioned, a very, very strong uh, uh, position on protecting that right. So uh, I, I just want to make sure, uh, as is now, it would not really affect us in California based on the current rule. However, uh, if Congress, on the other hand, were to pass some type of a legislation, not this current Congress certainly, but if the future Congress were to be able to pass a law to restrict the rights or even outright ban abortion as a federal law, that actually could affect California. Is that correct? So if the federal government were to pass a law that banned uh, abortion nationwide, then that would ostensibly affect California, of course, there may be challenges that could be raised to such a law. Um, but yes, you're correct that currently the Supreme Court's decision does not prohibit abortion in California or in, in any state for that matter. Right. So so certainly the, the, at the current state for the state of California per se, probably uh, it's not that um, directly affecting us uh, at this moment now, but certainly uh, the more direct effect that we would see uh, would likely be individuals that have lost the rights to receive their services in other states would certainly travel into California and we certainly would want to assist that as well. So there's certainly some fiscal impact potentially in the future uh, regarding providing these uh, services to those individuals who don't live, reside in California, right? Or just to make sure I, I understand the question, was the question that there are the, the, that we may be the county would be affected or may be able to assist people from out of state who do not have access to to abortion in their own state and that Correct. they may need to come here. Yeah, because one of the things I'm, I'm always concerned about is you have states passing, I uh, hate to say draconian uh, laws, not only just banning abortion, but now criminalizing uh, individuals who either to travel or to assist another individual to travel as a, some type of a misdemeanor or even criminal statute. So I just want to make sure that uh, that uh, uh, where we are, uh, and, and, and you don't necessarily have the answer, you can bring it back to us. I just want to make sure that whatever we do here, certainly uh, not, not only will we not uh, support those type of ruling, but certainly we'll be able to put, a, put up a good uh, 
defense in court uh, uh, if we were ever accused of a county or a state for supporting these efforts, which was considered criminal in other states? Yes, I think given the, thank you for that question, Supervisor Lee, given this sort of sensitive nature of, of the topic, perhaps it would be best if we, we uh, provided an opt agenda memo Good. addressing thank those concerns. Great, thank you. I'm sorry I did uh, surprise you on not giving you a heads up to ask these questions earlier, but certainly it's uh, something that has uh, completely changed the landscape of the laws. And I certainly want to make sure that uh, we are well protected legally uh, as best as we can in anticipation of these uh, 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 unfortunate scenarios that I've been talking about. And, and thank you very much, Rachel. Thank, uh, thank you, Sue Wesley, and thank you, Ms. Neal. Ms. Neal, I. Um, just to uh, weigh in on Supervisor uh, Lee's request, I think what I'm hoping that that confidential off agenda memo could provide is something in the way of what I would characterize as a liability assessment. Uh, um, and uh, to Supervisor Lee's point as well, uh, there clearly are cost implications, both with respect to liability, but also with respect to uh, providing services if we become uh, a provider to those who uh, are unable to get the healthcare services they need in other venues, and I think that's the that's the expectation realistically uh, that we're looking at. But in terms of county council's uh, role, I think if we could ask uh, the office to uh, council's office to, uh, in in effect, uh, provide us with a uh, a liability assessment, or if, if it's too early to assess, to at least identify um, possible areas where we might be uh, under attack, if you will, for uh, providing uh, services or accommodations, that would be helpful. Do you feel like uh, you and uh, the county council's office have a fair understanding of what the request is? Yes, I believe so. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, I have two other points. The first is I mentioned in passing at yesterday's board meeting that there has been a little uh, debate commentary from folks who are supportive of uh, uh, reproductive rights here in California, but who take issue with the actual language of Proposition 1, uh, notwithstanding that most of the, uh, if not all of the uh, mainstream pro-choice, uh, pro-reproductive freedoms organizations and individuals have uh, staked out a yes on one position. Has your office uh, given, had, had an opportunity yet to give any thought to uh, the implications of the language uh, as compared or contrasted with something that uh, you might have drafted if you'd had the opportunity? Uh, I don't think this is an issue where we've prepared anything as of yet, um, but would be happy to do so. Uh, a... Thank you. I, I think um, just in terms of helping us plan for the future, if that could be either um, a part of or in addition to or separate and apart from the liability uh, assessment and identification, uh, there are, as I say, some uh, com there are some comments, there's some commentary out there, both in the world of political pundits, but also uh, from some legal scholars from folks who would describe themselves as pro-choice, uh, but who take exception to the language of Prop 1. We could ask you to take a look at that and uh, again, give us uh, an off agenda report, confidential or not, as you deem appropriate. Is that uh, okay by you? Yes, thank you, Supervisor Smitty. Thank you. And then uh, I think you referenced in your initial presentation, uh, Ms. Neal, the um, the fact that the board took action back in, I believe it was early June, uh, to uh, direct county council to identify opportunities for engagement uh, on the litigation front, including as amicus, uh, and you mentioned this in passing. Um, have any, is it is it too early to say those opportunities are uh, out there and currently being assessed, or are we waiting to see what the legal lay of the land looks like a little more clearly in the weeks and months ahead. Where you know, where are we in the rollout of these various laws that you mentioned? Thank you, Supervisor. So we are monitoring the current litigation and sort of in the preliminary stages of assessing which cases we may be able to um, 
become involved in. Right now, it is too early, I think, to give specifics. Um, and you know, as and many of these, this litigation is still in very early stages. So I think uh, the plan is to report back as specific opportunities develop, uh, to report back to or as specific opportunities to engage in litigation uh, become more apparent. Thank you. If if I could uh, ask as one board member and as the chair of this task force uh, that that those updates be sooner rather than later and uh, more often rather than less often, I guess is the way I would put it. Um, I, I uh, you may or may not recall, Ms. Neal, I, I brought that uh, referral to the board back in early June. And, um, you know, I know we always have resource issues and we have to uh, ask ourselves when and where we want to weigh in, but I think it's pretty clear that this is uh, uh, at the highest priority level for our board uh, and will continue to be so in my estimation. Um, so, as I say, if you could keep us posted uh, more often rather than less often uh, and uh, more frequently rather than less frequently um, and sooner rather than later, that, that would be uh, helpful as well. Okay? Yes, I understand completely the importance of this. This issue right. to the board and you know more generally. All right. I think uh, I don't have anything else on this uh, part of the report except to say thank you uh, to you and your colleagues, uh, Ms. Neal. Mr. Press, Ms. Neal, anything else on, on this one before we move on to the Title IX uh, piece of the conversation? No, I have nothing additional on this. Thank you. All right. Thanks again. Mr. Press, back to you, I believe. Yes, thank you. Uh, so just again, uh, talking about title, the Title IX regulations, and just for our listening audience, just to give a little bit of background, um, when we talk about Title IX, we're talking about Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972, which did uh, turn uh, 50 years old uh, last June. And um, to, to, to match the timing, um, the proposed rule amendments that we're going to be talking about uh, in the next minute or so um, were actually uh, released on that birth date, if you will, of Title IX. So for most of the first 50 years of, of these uh, Title IX amendments and the, the implementing regulations and guidance was fairly stable, but unfortunately, like many things, uh, that stability was significantly upset during the Trump administration where then Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos uh, in May of 2020, well, actually earlier than that, she started to issue some guidance that was changing some Obama era, era guidance about how to do grievance hearings and things of that sort. So that was initially troubling, this change in guidance. Uh, and that is what led to the serve justice lawsuit that is noted in the county council chart that's appended to the agenda. That lawsuit because it pertained to pre-regulatory guidance was ultimately uh, stayed and has been in abeyance now for, for a number of years while uh, former Secretary DeVos and the department, the Federal Department of Education issued um, uh, amended rules that essentially transformed the Trump administration guidance into rule format in May of 2020. Those new rules then, of course, spawned, I believe it was at least four major lawsuits around the nation. Um, and so they never quite got off the ground. And then, of course, we had our intervening national election. President Biden came into office and right off the bat, uh, almost one of his first um, executive actions started to issue executive orders affecting Title IX. So in the, in the first spring of his term, uh, of his first year, in both January and March of 2021, President Biden issued two executive orders that were really designed to do two things. One, prevent uh, and combat discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. And also the second, guaranteeing an educational environment free from discrimination on the basis of sex including sexual orientation and gender identity. And as part of that second executive order that was issued in March of 2021, uh, 
it also directed the Secretary of Education to work with the federal Attorney General's office to go through a review of all of the recent regulations, orders, guidance, et cetera, um, to, for quote unquote, for consistency with Title IX, which we all read to mean they were gonna take another look at the rules that, the, that Secretary DeVos and the Trump administration had changed. And that's exactly what they did. So right now, uh, the uh, just recently uh, on June 23rd, it was, I believe, the Biden administration issued what we called what we call a notice of proposed rulemaking NPRM. And that would would substantially uh, amend the regulations issued by the previous federal administration, particularly on some key points. So I'll, I'll run through in a moment some of the, the high points, if you will, to 700 page notice of proposed rulemaking. So I will confess right now, I have not read all 700 pages. Mr. Press, let me interrupt for a moment. And sure. um, it may be that Supervisor Lee has followed all of this uh, point by point, but I have to confess, I got a little bit lost in the weeds there. So I wanna stop for a minute and, and sort of do a, uh, a status check with you if I may. Sure. And I'm going to ask you to uh, oversimplify if need be yep. to make sure. So we had Title IX in uh, 1972. Correct. And uh, I heard you say very clearly that uh, you know there was a, a fairly commonly understood and accepted uh, definition of what that did or didn't mean and how it would be implemented and what the rules were for, uh, I'm gonna say decades thereafter. Am I right so far or do you need yes, to- Yes, okay. correct. Then you very specifically referenced a pivot, is that my word again, when the Trump administration and Secretary DeVos weighed in with their uh, proposed rules. Am I still on track? Yeah, good, good characterization, absolutely, absolutely accurate. All right, and then what did or didn't happen with the proposed rules from Secretary DeVos? Those were challenged in four separate lawsuits. And I have to confess, I, I can't recall if any of those actually made their way to preliminary injunction. I think, I think some of them might have actually gone that far. I'll have to go back and check my notes. So my question is, were any of those rules implemented or were they all held in abeyance while there was either litigation or comment? I believe they were actually implemented. In other words, they, they, they actually became effective. Okay, so uh, sometime uh, in the recent past, the, I'm gonna call them the DeVos rules, uh, did in fact uh, take, uh, take force, yes? I believe that's correct, yes. Okay. Then the Biden administration arrives on the scene and what happens next again, please? So then right out of the gate, the Biden administration starts to issue a, a whole raft of executive orders. And one in particular in January of 2021, essentially started to set the stage for a revisiting of, of both this rule and frankly, many, many other rules um, that were uh, promulgated during the Trump administration. and. And then, so that was the first uh, executive order that said, you know, we need to, in essence, prevent and combat discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. Then the March 2021 executive order put a little more focus on that and said, and by that, we mean specifically, we need you to go through and review proposed rules, guidance, documents, orders, et cetera, for consistency with Title IX, i.e. we need to make sure we go back to where things right. were. So uh, when that executive order was issued, does that mean that the DeVos rules were held in abeyance during that uh, review or are they in force um, while that review is taking place? Yeah, no, great question. So the executive order cannot have uh, in most circumstances cannot have that impact. As we've discussed at some prior uh, task force meetings, unfortunately, uh, 
to undo, not in all cases, but in most cases, to undo a regulation, you kind of have to go through the whole process. It's almost like <laughs> to zip up, you have to basically zip back down. And so the we have to go through this whole process to undo or now amend the regulations to replace the language that the uh, Trump administration placed in the regs to, re to repeal and replace it with new language, which is again, what is, what is now uh, 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 on offer, if you will, with the notice of proposed rulemaking. So Mr. Press, let me stop you again, and mm -hmm. me, but I'm, I'm really trying to simplify this as much as possible. So does that mean that within the last half dozen years, education institutions across the country were working under the old model, then had to pivot to the DeVos model, are currently working with the DeVos model, but with the understanding that the DeVos model may change back again to something like the old model or altogether different? Uh, yes, although I would add, my take is that um, it would it would not be simply a reversion, but from what I've been reading about this notice of proposed rulemaking from the Biden administration, is that it would also be frankly updated. In other words, it might even be even more expansive in terms of the protections it provides for LGBTQ plus and for pregnant students. So frankly, offering more protection. All right, now just to uh, bring this to bear on our work here at the county, you will recall that in the fall of 2020, our board acted to uh, direct staff, including county council's office, I believe, to obtain uh, services uh, to provide essentially assessments of education institutions and other institutions here in Santa Clara County as to Title IX compliance. Uh, are you remembering uh, the board action that I'm talking about? Yes. Where does that stand and how do these pieces fit together? Yeah, so I, I, if I recall, we were, uh, we were securing uh, an outside vendor to handle that analysis. Yes. Yeah, and I believe that the county executive and maybe if someone from the county executive's office can speak to this, but I, I, I thought that I'd heard that they were still in the process of, of procuring that vendor. Let me see. I see that Dr. Smith uh, is uh, registered here, and I see Ms. Christian as well. Anybody able to give us an update on all that? Possibly not. Uh, Chairperson Samidian, this is Danielle Christian, Legislative Manager. I don't have current information on that, but I'm happy to connect with the Deputy County Executive who's working on it and provide both of your offices with an update. Yeah, if we could get a status report, that would be uh, helpful. The last recollection I have, Ms. Christian, is that um, there was an RFP, the initial uh, award uh, ultimately uh, went by the wayside when uh, the award winner, the RFP responder uh, withdrew uh, there was then some back and forth about uh, the extent to which it was necessary to have uh, legal counsel uh, provide the services. Uh, and uh, I, I don't have a memory of uh, this ever being uh, resolved. And part of the reason I'm asking is, um, you know, when we took this action in the fall of 2020, um, there was a sense of urgency about it. Uh, and uh, now the um, the challenge of apparently of getting a, a provider, a service provider in, in place has uh, delayed the matter for, you know, gosh, a year and a half. So um, anything you can do to uh, help make sure that we move along more expeditiously uh, would be uh, appreciated. And if you could get us a status report either from uh, your office or from county council's office, uh, that would be appreciated. Mr. Press, back to you. Sure. Um, let me 
Yep. Okay. I'm sorry, I was having trouble with with my um, mute button. I think I should figure it out by now. But um, with regard to the uh, uh, RFP and the successful we were not able to be uh, completed, so there was no contract is instituted. Another RFP went out. Um, we had little interest in uh, the RFP, and they're still uh, trying to work out whether the criteria will be changed to require a um, attorney to respond. So essentially, the um, pool of interested respondents is very small, and we're trying to figure out how to increase it so that we can give the board a appropriate uh, contract to uh, approve. All right, well, thank you for that uh, clarification. If we could get something off agenda in writing, Dr. Smith, uh, I would appreciate that, please. So uh, please consider that a formal request. And uh, also, let me just convey uh, the importance of uh, seeing if we can't um, make some progress sooner rather than later. All right. Uh, okay. thank you. Back to you, Mr. Press. Certainly. So now, um, I think timeline wise, we are at the stage of the Biden administration has now issued its notice of proposed rulemaking. And just to remind everyone, the rulemaking process um, is, starts with what we call notice and comment. So that's where we are right now. Um, so this proposed rule has come out. We are in the we are in the comment period. Um, we are obligated to, um, like anyone else, get our comments in by September twelfth, and we are planning to do that. So we will we will be submitting uh, the comments on, on on these particular rules. And uh, in that vein, I just wanted to offer just a little bit of specificity in case any of the listening audience also wanted to comment on these rules. That one section in particular uh, of the of the rules as they currently exist that require, I think, by many of our estimations, um, amendment is section 106.45, and this is a provision that pertains to grievance hearings, um, which involve accusations of sexual harassment um, that occur um, in on. Uh, uh, college and university campuses, or at least related to conduct uh, of college and university students, I should say, to be more accurate. Um, as you may recall, supervisors, um, this particular, the, the changes that the uh, DeVos and Trump administration had made to these rules um, were, were on this particular rule was, was, was quite alarming in that it made live in-person hearings required for these types of um, uh, accusations, if you will, and responses. And it also required uh, live in-person cross-examination of victims. And as you can imagine, and as we had heard um, at, at some board meetings from a number of people who were providing public comment, those types of live and confrontational um, in-person features to these hearings um, were uh, beyond traumatizing to the point of being chilling that people simply did not want to go through with these types of proceedings. Um, and so that has been a one of the uh, focuses of these amended rules is to now make live hearings optional uh, of these types of grievance hearings and also to not require live cross-examination, but instead returning it to the previous model of leaving a lot more discretion to the hearing officers to figure out how to accept and receive testimony, but doing so in a way that's going to protect um, uh, uh, the, the witnesses a lot better and not put them through uh, anything more re-traumatizing than necessary. So I just wanted to highlight that as one particular feature of the proposed rules. Thank you. Yeah. All and right. I, anything yeah. else or should I? Yeah, uh, just, 
yeah, sorry, sorry, just a few other features about the proposed rules, as I think I may have mentioned. Um, they also provide um, more comprehensive protection from sex harassment than, than before. Uh, now it uh, covers also uh, protections against um, uh, for, for pregnancy uh, and as well as for uh, 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 sexual orientation and gender identity. So again, a, a much broader, more current reach. Um, and then what else? Uh, that's probably, those are probably the, the, I would say the three major features. There's, as I said, it's a 700 page rule. There's a lot of detail in those rules, um, but we will be scouring them all 701 pages for our forthcoming uh, comment that we will make to these rules. All right, thank you very much for that. Supervisor Lee, questions, comments? Yeah, actually, um, uh, no further at this point, but thank you. That was a very good discussion on the uh, development and hopefully they can move sooner than, than later on uh, getting these uh, draconian rules uh, change thank you yeah well i would just add on that comment as we've discussed at some of the prior meetings it was really only at the tail end of the trump administration that he was able to undo some rules that were promulgated during the obama administration so i think it's fair to say that while i believe well this one clearly is on a faster track than some of the other uh regulatory efforts that are either underway or likely to soon be underway we're going to be at this for a few years because there's a there's unfortunately a lot to undo, and um, as we've discussed, it takes it takes a lot of process to um, to undo a regulation. Thank you, Ms. Press. Um, I I uh, I have had my questions addressed uh, by virtue of my interruptions. Uh, I hope that didn't throw you off track too Not much. Not at all. <laughs> and uh, anything else on the report from County Council before I check in with the clerk to see if we have public comment. That's all we have for today. All right, well, thank you to both you and Ms. Neal and the rest of your office. Let me just check with the clerk, see if there are any members of the public who wish to speak on this item or for that matter, any uh, members of our county staff. We have no speakers on this item, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Then um, we'll ask that uh, since this was a formally agendized report that we get a motion from Supervisor Lee to receive the report. And so moved, yes. Thank mm -hmm. you. I'll second. Could you call the roll just for the record, uh, Mr. Leon? Uh, I know it helps the clerk if we have a formal roll call on these things. Certainly. Vice Chairperson Lee? Aye. And Chairperson Simidian? Aye. Thank you. Uh, uh, formally received and uh, unanimously so. All right. That takes us to... Uh, the Office of the County Executive and uh, their staff and um, uh, including consultants on uh, items of interest and in this case particularly including the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 and it's two lines on our uh, agenda but uh, much more substantial obviously uh, than that. So Ms. Christian do I turn to you to uh, conduct the orchestra here? Yes, thank you, Chairperson Samidian. Um, again, for people who are online, I'm Danielle Christian, the Legislative Manager. And on this item, we have three issues that we wanted to provide information on to the task force. I'll provide some very brief overview on two executive orders related to reproductive health care uh, that President Biden has issued following the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs. And then Prime Policy Group will provide an update on the federal appropriations process and have a longer conversation discussion overview on the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, which was signed into law yesterday and includes various climate change, renewable energy, tax, and healthcare related provisions. So moving on into the executive orders and following up on County Council's report and the acknowledgement of the board's interest and in actions related to protecting reproductive freedom, I wanted to just provide some general information about them. The first, Protecting Access to Reproductive Health Care Services, was signed on July 8th. The order recognized that eliminating the right recognized in Roe has had and will continue to have devastating implications for women's health and public health more broadly. The order builds on the actions previously taken by Biden's administration to defend reproductive rights by safeguarding access to reproductive health care services, including abortion and contraception, 
protecting the privacy of patients and their access to accurate information, promoting the safety and security of patients, providers, and clinics, and coordinating the implementation of federal efforts to protect reproductive rights and access to healthcare through the establishment of an interagency task force by Health and Human Services and the White House Gender Policy Council. On August 3rd, the date of the first interagency's task force meeting, the president issued the second executive order titled Securing Access to Reproductive and Other Healthcare Services. This order builds on actions that the administration has taken to protect access to reproductive healthcare services, <coughs> excuse me, healthcare services, and defend women's fundamental rights. Through the second executive order, the president announced actions to support patients traveling out of state for medical care um, to ensure healthcare providers comply with federal non discrimination law and also to promote research and data collection on maternal health outcomes. Again, I, I just wanted to provide some broad information for informational purposes. I'm happy to attempt to answer any questions, but I will be providing some more detailed information um, in a memo to the full board. Thank you for that. Um, I think well covered. Uh, Supervisor Lee, comments or questions? Uh, no, thank you. All okay. right. Great. Well, thank you very much. Then I'm going to turn it over to Rich Mead, the Vice Chairman of Prime Policy Group, to provide information on the other two items I mentioned. Thank you very much. Mr. Mead, welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Christian. Um, in our report today, we were going to give an update on the appropriations process in Congress and the recently enacted into law Inflation Reduction Act. Let me start with the appropriations process and then turn to the Inflation Reduction Act where I'll be joined by my partner, Aquila Powell, in describing the law. We will give a high-level overview of the law, but are happy to take questions on any of the specifics as you, uh, as you have interest in them. Um, the House of Rep Representatives have passed six or half the appropriations bills. The House voted in, in July on the Consolidated Appropriations Act, which contained the following appropriation bills, agriculture, energy and water, financial services, interior environment, military constructions, veteran affairs, and transportation and HUD. Uh, this passed the House on a straight party line vote. Um, and we have provided uh, to your office the, uh, the, the details on the funding levels in those bills on the, on the accounts that you guys are the most interested in. Um, the Senate may bundle the remaining six uh, appropriations bills for vote in September. The Senate Appropriations Committee has not been able to agree on a top line number and therefore is not able to move any of the bills in a 50-50 Senate where the committees are evenly divided. However, the majority uh, of the Appropriations Committee in the Senate has posted on their website drafts of the bills, so outlining the position of the majority of the committee on, on where they see their priorities within all of the 12 appropriations bills. Let me turn to the Inflation Reduction Act. And I'll start with the healthcare provisions because that is what the Democrats in the Senate initially agreed to. And for a long time, the conventional wisdom was that those provisions were going to be the only provisions that got enacted as part of the reconciliation process. But that changed suddenly in July. And Mr. Margo Margolin, please feel free to jump in on our discussion of these health provisions, or if you'd prefer to hold back and cover them as part of your report, Either way is, is fine with us. But there are three main uh, health provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act. First, the bill extends the health insurance premium tax credits for plans purchased under the Affordable Care Act for three additional years. The American Rescue Plan passed early last year had put in place these uh, uh, tax uh, uh, credits for two years, and they were set to expi expire at the end of this year. The, beauty of the timing of this being enacted now is that it allows the, the pricing of the of the plans under the Affordable Care Act to factor in these subsidies going forward. There's concern that if the future of these subsidies were uncertain, the plans would, would have to price their premiums much, much higher than they would without the subsidies. So, so now we're, uh, we've got some stability there and we've got uh, the ability for these plans to come out with some affordable, reasonable premiums this fall for the plans uh, for next year. Um, the second big section of the healthcare uh, portion of this uh, law is um, around drug pricing. And the bill allows the federal government to, for the first time ever to negotiate the top prices of the most expensive drugs in the Medicare program. 
the Department of Health and Human Services will identify the top 100 most expensive drugs without competition that have been on the market for at least seven years. From that list, HHS would then select 10 drugs for negotiation starting in 2026, rising up to 20 by 2029. The bill also caps the out-of-pocket expenses of seniors under the Medicare Part D program at $2,000 starting in 2025. And the bill also mandates coverage of vaccines with no cost sharing or deductibles beginning January 1, 2023. The bill also forces drug makers to issue rebates if their prices increase faster than inflation. And they set the rate of inflation, the base rate is uh, 2021. That's from that point forward is how they'll judge the, uh, the, the increase in prices of the drugs under those programs. Finally, the bill delays the Trump administration's drug rebate rule until 2032, which generates a significant amount of uh, savings. The last provision in the bill caps insulin con costs under the Medicare program at $35 per month from 2023 until 2025, and then caps it at the lesser of $35 per month or 25% of the negotiated price by HHS. Initially, the bill had capped uh, insulin in all insurance plans, but the Senate parliamentarian ruled that the provision uh, violated the so-called bird rule, and the majority was not able to get the 60 votes needed to waive the Budget Act to keep that provision applying to all plans in the bill. Um, I'm going to just turn to some of the other provisions of this bill briefly, just to give you an overview. Um, so the, the bill um, is financed by uh, increase in revenue, and not only does that pay for the spending initiatives in the bill, but it also will lead to uh, a deficit reduction of about $300 billion over 10 years. And the three tax provisions include uh, a new corporate minimum tax on 15% on the so-called book income, or the income that companies report to shareholders. The bill also imposes a one a percent excise tax of fair market value of any stock repurchases in a tax year by publicly traded companies. And then the bill provides the IRS with $80 billion in new funding to better enforce our tax laws. The Congressional Budget Office pro projects that funding and the hiring of a lot more IRS agents will bring in an additional uh, over $200 billion uh, in tax revenue. There's been a lot uh, out there about what this means in terms of, of, of uh, new IRS agents. And the bill doesn't specify hiring of any agents. It just provides the funding for the IRS. And yes, they can hire more personnel because their personnel is, is down from what it was even a few years ago. But it also can they can also use the money for uh, upgrade in their computer systems and software and things of that nature too. Whatever tools they need to better enforce the tax laws, they can do it with this with these resources. Finally, the last issue I'm going to touch upon is agriculture, and the bill includes $18 billion for the U.S. Department of Agriculture to make loans and grants through 2026 for greener agricultural practices. And again, if you want more specifics on that, we can turn to that. And let me, with that, now turn it over to Quilla, who's going to cover the rest of the bridges in the bill. Thanks, Rich. Supervisor Samiti and Supervisor Lee, it's a pleasure to see you both again. The, in, the Inflation Reduction Act accomplishes several key Biden policy agenda items. In addition to the provisions that which are recovered, the law also represents a significant change in energy and climate investments. I'm going to give a top line overview of those provisions, in addition to a few other areas that may be relevant to Santa Clara County. Let's start with energy and, and climate. The historic investments included in the ILA would bring down consumer energy costs, increase American energy security, while substantially reducing greenhouse emissions. The combined investments in the FY22 budget reconciliation bill would put the U.S. on a path to roughly 40% emissions reduction by 2030 and would represent the single biggest climate emission in U.S. history by far. The bill attempts to do that by lowering energy costs by providing a range of incentives to consumers to relieve the high cost of energy, energy and decrease utility bills. Nine billion in consumer home energy rebate programs. Excuse the interruption, Ms. Powell. I'm, I'm having some audio trouble again here. Uh, 
it, it's just a little bit of a volume problem. So if you can adjust accordingly, I have you at the highest possible volume on my computer. Supervisor Lee, uh, are you doing okay at your end or are you also, uh, uh, would you also benefit from a little more volume? Yeah, more volume would be good, thank you. Thank you, sorry to interrupt, but I wanna make sure we catch everything you say, Ms. Powell. Absolutely, thank you so much. Is this better now? It is, thank you. Wonderful. It also, the bill also provides 10 years of consumer tax credits to make homes energy efficient and to run on clean energy, making heat pumps, rooftop solar, electric HVAC and water heaters more affordable. It also provides 4,000 consumer tax credit, 4,000 in consumer tax credits for lower and middle income individuals to buy used clean vehicles and up to a $7,500 tax credit to buy new clean vehicles. This section of the energy climate provisions focuses on energy security and domestic manufacturing. The bill will support energy reliability and cleaner energy production coupled with historic investments in American clean energy manufacturing. It includes over 60 billion to store clean energy manufacturing in the US across the full supply chain of energy, of clean energy and transportation technology. The incentives will help alleviate inflation and reduce the risk of future price shocks by bringing down the cost of clean energy and clean vehicles. For example, production tax credits to, accept, to accelerate U.S. manufacturing of solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, and critical minerals processing, estimated to invest $30 billion. $10 billion in investment tax credits to build clean technology manufacturing facilities, like facilities to make electric vehicles, wind turbines, and panels, solar panels, that is. And $500 million was included in part of the Defense Production Act for heat pumps and critical minerals processing. It also includes $2 billion in grants to retool existing auto manufacturing facilities to make clean vehicles, ensuring the auto manufacturing jobs stay in the communities that depend on. Up to $20 billion in loans to build new clean vehicle manufacturing facilities and $2 billion for national labs to accelerate breakthrough energy research. The third area, decarbonize the economy. The investments in this bill will reduce emissions in every sector of the economy, substantially reducing emissions from electricity production, transportation, industrial manufacturing, buildings, and agriculture. It provides tax credits for clean sources of energy and energy storage and roughly 30 billion in targeted grant and loan programs for states and electric utilities to accelerate the transition to clean electricity. Tax credits and grants for clean fuels and clean commercial vehicles to reduce emissions for all, from all parts of the transportation sector. Grants and tax credits to reduce emissions from industrial manufacturing processes, including almost 6 billion in a, for a new advanced industrial facility deployment program to reduce emissions from the largest industrial emit emitters like chemical, steel, and cement plants. Over $9 billion for federal procurement of American-made technologies to create a stable market for clean products, including $3 billion for the U.S. Postal Service to reduce to purchase zero emissions vehicles. 27 billion in clean energy technology accelerators to support deployment of technologies to reduce emissions, especially in disadvantaged communities. The fourth area, environmental justice. The package includes over 60 billion in environmental justice priorities to drive investments into disadvantaged communities. Some highlights include the environmental and climate justice block grants funded at 3 billion, to invest in community-led projects in disadvantaged communities and increase community capacity building centers to address environmental and public health harms. The, the Neighborhood Access and Equity Grants funded at $3 billion to support equity, safety, and affordable transportation access with competitive grants to reconnect communities divided by existing infrastructure barriers. Grants to reduce pollution at ports funded at $3 billion, and $1 billion for clean, heavy-duty vehicles like school and transit bus and garbage trucks. 
Some of the previously mentioned programs that focus on disadvantaged and low-income communities are also important to env environmental justice, like the technology accelerator and consumer home energy rebate programs. In addition, the many, many of the clean energy tax credits include either a bonus or set-aside structure to drive investments in those communities. The final area of the energy section focuses on farmers, forest land owners, and resilient rural communities. The bill will make historic investments to ensure that rural communities are at the forefront of climate solutions. The investments affirm the central role of agricultural producers and forest land owners in our climate solutions by investing in climate smart agriculture, forest, re forest restoration, and land conservation. It also makes significant investments in clean energy development in rural communities. It does so by providing more than 20 billion to support climate smart agricultural practices, 5 million to support healthy fire resistant, fire resilient forests, forest conservation and urban tree planting. Tax credits and grants to, su to support the domestic production of biofuels and to build the infrastructure needed for sustainable aviation fuel and other biofuels. The other two areas that I wanted to mention, moving on beyond energy and climate, is drought relief and tribal. The drought provisions in the ILA will fund water conservation, habitat restoration, and mitigation efforts by distributing $4 billion to states, public water facilities, water and water districts, including $12.5 million to mitigate the effect of, of drought on tribal land. It provides $4 billion to the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation for Drought Relief, $550 million for domestic water product programs in disadvantaged communities, and $12.5 million for emergency drought funding for the tribes. The Critical Investments in, inflation, in the Inflation Reduction Act support native-driven climate resilience and advanced tribal energy development. That concludes my section. Are there any questions? Why don't we hold off on questions if that's agreeable to you, Supervisor Lee, until we hear from Mr. Margolin and without objection, I'm going to uh, sort of fold items six and seven together, Ms. Uh, Ms. Powell, so that we can have a, a wide ranging conversation. Mr. Margolin, what would you like to share on the health front? And then we'll open it up for questions and comments on the entirety of items six and seven without objection. All right, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for having me here, supervisors. Um, uh, Mr. Mead did an excellent job of summarizing the health provisions, and I won't go over the ground he's already covered in the Inflation Reduction Act, but I do want to make two observations, provide a little more context and data. Uh, the three year extension of the Affordable Care Act subsidies, very, very important. Um, uh, development that needed to get done. As Mr. Mead said, there was a consensus that if nothing else gets done, the Democrats wanted to get this, th this health provision through, uh, along with the drug pricing changes. Um, Covered California recently put out an analysis of what would have happened if the three-year extension had not occurred. And it's worth noting because, again, three years is three years. At some point, there'll be a debate about extending this further. Um, uh, the the um, uh, the earlier uh, creation of the subsidies, uh, according to Covered California, the initial action in the American Recovery Act uh, provided a 20% reduction in premiums under Covered California. These enhanced subsidies uh, produced that 20% reduction in premiums. If that enhanced subsidy um, uh, package had been um, withdrawn this year, had expired this year, there would have been um, a, uh, a massive impact on Covered California. They estimated that of the 1.8 million people in Covered California, approximately 1 million of them would have had their out-of-pocket costs literally doubled because of the withdrawal of premium subsidy. They estimated that 220,000 Californians would, of the 1.8 would have actually dropped coverage because it wouldn't have been affordable any longer. And other, other analysts have uh, project, had projected that 3 million of the 14 million in uh, in the exchange system nationally would have lost coverage. So getting this through was really important. Uh, it had a major impact on uh, Californians. And uh, again, there was a three-year extension. On the drug pr 
pricing of provisions, I want to just note the following. We had a discussion, supervisor submitting in uh, at the last uh, uh, hearing about um, the impact on commercial uh, health insurance, that what impact would this have beyond the Medicare population? And there were provisions in this bill to extend protections and provisions to general commercial insurance. Um, there was, for instance, in this inflation cap provision, which says you can't increase the cost of drugs overall beyond the, the CPI uh, urban calculation. You can't go beyond that without paying a, a penalty to the federal government. The original proposal sent to the Senate, uh, negotiated with Senator Manchin by, by Senator Schumer, applied that to commercial insurance as well as Medicare. But the Senate parliamentarians said that wasn't allowed. And that along with the uh, application of that uh, insulin cap of $35 a month, which applies to Medicare, it was supposed to originally apply to private insurance. That was also um, deemed not uh, allowable by, this, by the Senate parliamentarian. So we'll and excuse, excuse the interruption yes. and Mr. Sure. Mead or Ms. Powell, feel free to weigh in as well. I just want to confirm something, and it's not good news, but I want to confirm it anyway. The, the drug pricing and the insulin cap uh, and the inflation uh, controls are all limited to Medicare eligible folks. Am I right about that? Yes? That, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. So, you know, uh, I, I want to be happy about the things we should be happy about, obviously, but just to be very clear, if you're 25, 35, 45, 55, and you are not on Medicare, none of that really does anything for you. Not directly, no. Uh, okay. And the subsidy uh, clearly does. I, I understand that. Does. I, just, I just want to be clear. Yes. And Mr. Mead, uh, you would, and Ms. Powell, you would be less uh, aware, I think, but Mr. Margolin knows uh, I have been pushing a, uh, a program here in uh, Santa Clara County called MedAssist with support from my colleagues and implementation from Health and Hospitals. Thank you again. Um, that essentially subsidizes the cost of what I call life essential high cost uh, drugs. Uh, I'm talking about EpiPens, I'm talking about inhalers, and I'm talking about insulin. And uh, again, you know, I, I had some hope that this might be a short term transition uh, until we got federal action. But what I'm hearing is for the time being, if you're 25, 35, 45, 55, and you're not on Medicare, you, you don't get any relief from this federal uh, legislation on those three drugs. Is that a fair characterization, Mr. Margolin? That, that is correct. All right. And Mr. Mead, I see you and Ms. Powell nodding, I think. So I just, and and I uh, I don't want to pretend uh, anything here. I'm Supervisor Lee, I'm, I'm being wholly unsubtle because I know you've been uh, as a health and hospital committee member supportive of this uh, effort as well. And I just, uh, I want to tee up for everyone that uh, that program is, uh, I would argue, more essential uh, than ever now that we've gotten a clear indication that we can't look to the feds for the foreseeable future for help on that front. All right, Mr. Margolin, back to you. Thank you for letting me uh, uh, put my commercial announcement in the middle of your presentation. Thank you. Certainly. Well, those are the two points I wanted to make in relationship to this uh, this package. There's there's more to be said about it, but again, Mr. Mead covered the, the general terrain. Um, it is quite significant, this effort to get Medicare to negotiate uh, the price of prescription drugs is has been decades. It's a decades long battle, and uh, the the fact that it's a reality and that it's going to include over time dozens and dozens of drugs is very significant, and it, it of course establishes a precedent at some point for this being applied to the commercial marketplace. But as we just noted, it didn't happen this this time around. Yeah, I, I don't want to uh, rain on the parade here. I think this is uh, yes. extraordinary uh, progress. Uh, not all that we might have hoped for, but uh, more than we had reason to expect just a month or two ago. So uh, fair enough. On the um, uh, staying on the healthcare uh, side yes. for for a moment, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the uh, the data on just how significant the subsidy is um, uh, on covered California. Um, it, it we. As you know, we have various marketing efforts here at the county to try and encourage people to get themselves covered. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and uh, I, let me see if I can pull Dr. Smith back into the mix a little bit here as well. Does this suggest that this might be a time for all of us to uh, essentially re-up our outreach to the community now that we have some some good news to focus on the good news to share with respect to um, uh, getting folks uh, onto the uh, Covered California and the Affordable Care Act. Dr. Smith, do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, and we're already preparing for that. Um, <clears throat> the way that our majority of patients um, are seen are through the Medi-Cal processes and um, it's all managed Medi-Cal. So uh, we're trying to increase uh, uh, registration and improve access and working with family health plan to get them to delegate more lives to the county. In addition, we do have, as you mentioned, covered California, which you know benefits from the continued subsidies and we're seeing a good increase in moment in covered California. So we're moving ahead with that. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Margolin, did I hear you correctly? I was scribbling notes furiously and I want to make sure my notes are accurate that there are some estimates that of the 1.8 million folks on coverage in California, absent the subsidy, as many as a million of them would have had a doubling in their cost. Yes, that's what Covered California released as an analysis uh, a few weeks ago. Okay. Um, uh, so before we go on to other um, healthcare issues with you, Mr. Margolin, including the COVID status and the uh, MPOX, uh, the, um, let me just make sure we wrap up our business here on uh, the entire IRA uh, Supervisor Lee, uh, any questions or comments uh, in connection with what we've heard from uh, Ms. Powell, Mr. Mead, uh, or Mr. Margolin on IRA matters, uh, which are obviously not only health care, but as Ms. Powell uh, detailed very helpfully, uh, the climate uh, measures as well. Uh, no further questions. Thanks for the uh, very comprehensive update. There was a lot in there. Thank you. All right. And Ms. Christian, thank you for the bullet points, by the way. I don't think I mentioned that earlier. Mr. Mead, Ms. Powell, anything else on IRA that you want to share with us, either uh, because it just came to you or because it was prompted by the back and forth I had with uh, Mr. Margolin? The only thing I'll add is that uh, Supervisor Lee noted that some of the um, education provisions were dropped, as were the housing provisions. And I know in the House, the committee chairs over those programs were very upset by the fact that their provisions were left out. You know, the prospects for them moving forward, absent the reconciliation vehicle may not be great, but nevertheless, the chairs in the House uh, are, are going to continue to push those priorities. I would just add, Commissioner Simidian, to your point earlier, we are a long way from Build Back Better. When this started, there were numerous proposals that were going to be included that did not make it in with a 50-50 Senate and a House almost equally divided. Um, this law is progress because quite honestly, I don't think anything else would make it through this current um, You know, we'll have to see where many of those proposals that landed on the cutting room floor, they end up um, in, in the future. But I, I think right now, this this is progress and it is an accomplishment. It may not be everything that everyone wanted, but I, this is probably um, as good as it was going to get for the time. Well, well, thank you. I uh, appreciate closing on a more upbeat note. I, I do think, notwithstanding my earlier expression of concerns, this is a glass that is very much more than half full. Uh, I guess Mr. Mead, uh, Ms. Powell, uh, and um, Mr. Margolin, if uh, if you care to weigh in, uh, I, you know I don't want to devolve into uh, rank gossip here, but um, you know I think as I said a couple months ago, everybody thought this was pretty much gonna uh, be a non-starter. Uh, to whom do we give credit, uh, Mr. Schumer, President Biden? I mean, who who pulled the rabbit out of the hat to get the necessary votes here at the twelfth hour plus? The, the the sort of r rumor is it was uh, Larry Summer, um, uh, Senator uh, um, 
Warner from Virginia talked to Larry Summer and said, you need to talk to Senator Manchin and tell him that, that if we do these things, it won't be inflationary. And Larry Summer did do that. And I think that was sort of the tipping point. Again, the rumor has it that that's sort of the tipping point to get uh, Manchin more fully back to the table to negotiate a more robust package. All right. And um, let me just ask, uh, I think uh, was mentioned a couple times that the subsidy extension is a uh, back to health care subsidy extension is for three years. When do those three years begin and end? And when does that mean Congress will have to have this conversation all over again about whether or not the subsidy gets extended yet again? How how long can we uh, sort of, uh, you know, take a deep breath and exhale? And then how long before we have to be right back at it again? So the subsidies are for are for calendar years 2023, 2024, and 2025. So, you know, August of, of 2025 is when Congress will have to make the decision whether or not to extend them. And um, I would say this, that absent these going in the reconciliation bill, I actually was one who believed that there might be bipartisan support for extending these uh, provisions because they are popular, because they do help across the board with you know, lower premiums. So uh, it's quite likely that these will live beyond the 2025 expiration date. That said, Mr. Mead, Mr. Margola, Ms. Powell, my observation as we've uh, talked with you over the past few years is that very little happens until the last minute, maybe even half an hour after the last minute. Um, so when do we think Congress will be taking up this extension of the extension, uh, if you had five dollars in your office pool, well, like I said, uh, they were done, you know, August uh, before they're set to expire this year. So I looked at August of 2025 for action on this uh, again, because again, like you said, Congress always takes things right up to the edge of the cliff before before deciding them. And, and again, probably in a rec reconciliation vehicle similar to what we're, 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 was used this time, although again, hard to predict with certainty. So uh, folks, let me press this point just a little bit more. While we who are in the healthcare delivery world might wish that the next Congress in 23-24, following the next election, would take action uh, to uh, formalize an extension well in advance of the expiry date, um, your your best assessment is that that's not likely given the way Congress works. Now, I put a lot of words into your mouth. Is that, were they accurate words that I just put in your mouth? I, I think that's an accurate description, is that without the deadline being in their face, Congress is not likely to act upon this. And, and the other thing I would say in this uh, picks up on Mr. Mead's point, you would think this would be bipartisan potentially because of the fact that it helps uh, uh, consumers, lowers costs, but it is the Affordable Care Act. And even though the Republican effort to repeal it is suspended, um, hopefully indefinitely, um, if you if you raise the issue of the Affordable Care Act, it, it's, it's a controversial issue in the Republican caucuses, and they are reluctant to do anything to strengthen that program, at least as of as of this year, we'll see where we are in a couple of years, but that's another impediment. All right. Um, I'm going to just say that whenever you say Affordable Care Act, it's fraught. That's kind of the- That's what it is. Yes, nature it's of fraught. The All right. Ms. Powell, thank you. Mr. Mead, thank you. I'm going to pivot now to the last portion of item seven. Thanks, everybody, for your flexibility and smushing together these two items. Uh, what else should we know on the healthcare front, uh, Mr. Margolin? Uh, particularly with respect to uh, COVID at the federal level and now MPOX? So the, the main issue I want to report on is the, the monkeypox vaccine issue. Um, um, again, there's a lot else going on at the federal level, but nothing dramatically different from what we were a month ago. But monkeypox is the crisis of the moment, and there's a lot going on in that, in that realm. Uh, the first thing to sort of note here is that um, based on... Uh, Reporting yesterday, uh, monkeypox is in all 50 states of the United States. Um, there, there were approximately 12,600 cases in the United States identified yesterday. But to show you how significantly it is expanding, 
Last week, that case count was at, at about uh, 9,000. So again, it's going up uh, percentage-wise significantly week over week. California is number two in the nation when it comes to monkeypox. We have, uh, as of yesterday, 1,945 cases. New York, the national leader, is at 2,600 cases. Um, currently, 90, 94% of these cases involve men who have had intimate contact with other men, but that uh, percentage is likely to evolve and change over time as this uh, disease spreads throughout the, throughout, throughout the community. Uh, the administration acknowledged last month that um, the demand for the, the preferred two-dose vaccine regimen, uh, Genios is, is the vaccine that's preferred here. The demand for that far exceeds the supply. The federal government has hundreds of thousands of doses available they need millions to cope uh, with um, the disease as it spreads. Um, Health and Human Services has placed orders for 5 million additional doses, but they're not likely to arrive and be usable until later this year or the beginning of next. So how do we get in this predicament? Just a, a moment of history here about uh, how this vaccine crisis occurred. We used to have 20 million doses of this vaccine available in the federal stockpile as of 2013. And the stockpile was built up to that enormous number because this is the same vaccine that is used for smallpox. Um, and it was, it was built up between 2001 and 2013 because there was a federal uh, government perception that uh, smallpox as a bioterror weapon was a risk to the nation, and even though smallpox had, had, had close, was close to being eradicated in the world, um, the threat of it being used as a weapon required that we build up a big national reserve. So 13 million doses, um, I'm sorry, I say 13 million doses, it was 20 million doses, not 13 million, as of 2013. Um, the problem occurs in that the, the vaccine only has a three-year shelf life. So the federal government had 20 million doses in 2013, and you have a three-year shelf life. It's enormously costly to sort of manufacture these doses. Um, they, um, the federal government decided they needed to develop a new methodology for producing this vaccine, and they wanted to develop and plan to develop a freeze-dried technology that would allow the vaccines to live for a much longer period of time and be viable for a longer period of time. And while they were working on the freeze-dry technology, they allowed the 20 million doses to, um, to sit on the shelves. And over time, because of the three-year lifespan, they expired. And at the time of the, of the monkeypox crisis that we're now experiencing, the 20 million had become a few hundred thousand doses of viable vaccine. Now, they, the federal government did work with uh, the, the, the pharmaceutical company that manufactures this vaccine to stockpile the raw materials to make millions and millions of doses. And, the, and that stockpiled raw material is there. But again, they were hoping for this freeze dry technology to come along and allow them to have more than a three year shelf life. Three year, the freeze dry technology did not come along. The large stockpile um, for the most part expired and the Biden administration found itself with this crisis, only a few hundred thousand doses. We need millions, what do we do? So. Last week, the Biden administration, the FDA, came out with an em emergency use authorization to allow this vaccine to be uh, stretched, the supply to be stretched uh, by a new delivery mechanism that allows the doses to be divided into fifths. Divided, one dose becomes five doses. And it would be delivered uh, rather than uh, subcutaneously you know, through your skin uh, intradermally which is under the skin. It's a different technique for, for delivering the shot. Based upon a study that the federal government did a few years ago, they believe that intradermal under the skin application produ would produce or will produce a strong immune response and can work. And you can produce that strong immune response with one fifth the volume of vaccine. So a few hundred thousand doses can become therefore potentially a few million doses. What is the need currently? The FDA estimates that currently there are 1.7 million people who are at elevated risk for monkeypox. Now, this number has to be a dynamic changing number. It's not going to be static because it's spreading, but 
as of now, they, they figure 1.7 million people. If you, if, you need, if you use the full dose approach, and remember it's a, it's a two dose application, 28 days apart from the first dose to the second dose, you need over 3 million, three and a half million doses uh, to reach the currently identified population. Um, there's no way with the few hundred thousand they have currently, even with new supply coming in, that they can come close to meeting that uh, demand. So the FDA did the emergency use authorization last week, uh, which would, uh, which would uh, substantially increase to the extent public health departments want to utilize this approach. It would, it would increase the availability of monkeypox vaccine. Um, and, and that's what the plan is. Uh, they also have this purchase of 5 million doses uh, underway, but of course there's a lot of work required to take the raw materials, assemble them into a vaccine, do, do the other steps and stages, including the quality and controls and, and uh, safety inspections that have to occur, and that will take uh, a period of months. There is one other strategy that I want to just mention in passing that some jurisdictions have applied beyond uh, breaking the dose into, into fifths. And that is to move to a single dose strategy, where even though you need the second dose to get full impact, some jurisdictions, because of the crisis, are, um, provi are prioritizing first doses. And if they have you know, 50,000 uh, vaccination doses, they try to get most of those out as first doses. And knowing that there's a risk that, risk that the second dose might be delayed beyond the recommended 28 days, some jurisdictions are making the judgment that that's worth it. So, Prime examples of that are New York City, which is prioritizing first dose strategy and Great Britain. Um, there are, uh, you know, the, the, the CDC is not um, endorsing this approach uh, necessarily. There, there's controversy about that. In fact, there's controversy also attached to the uh, divide by five approach. There are independent academic public health experts who question whether that's the right way to go, even though that was the FDA judgment. Uh, the one manufacturer in the world of Genios is Bavarian Nordic. It's a Denmark-based company. They're the ones that have to generate these 5 million additional doses, and they are um, you know, working rapidly to do that. But again, there are these uh, technological and practical limitations. Uh, Mr. Uh, Margolin, before we go on to uh, the state of affairs with uh, COVID, uh, you know, two plus years in, uh, I, I want to ask a uh, not rhetorical question, and then go to Supervisor Lee, uh, staying on MPOX for a minute. Um, you know, having been through the COVID experience the last two and a half years now, and listening to your report, if we had a vast audience, and we don't at this task force, as you know, uh, if we had a vast audience of people who were not in government, were not healthcare professionals, but who were you know, members of the general public, uh, I think some of them might be moved to say, what the hell's the matter with our public health infrastructure in this country that we knew we needed 20 million doses, we had 20 million doses, and, you know, nine years later, we have a minuscule fraction of what uh, we once had because we were waiting indefinitely for a technology over almost a decade that uh, never came to fruition. Uh, is that unduly harsh? Well, th there, th there were errors in judgment made. Uh, again, 20 million was, they weren't anticipating monkeypox, they were, they were anticipating smallpox, which is, you know, fart, which is fatal and in, in, in significant, in a, in a significant percentage of cases. So, but, but, but the point remains, whether it's monkeypox or smallpox, they knew this was a vaccine needed there are, there, there's another vaccine, I'll give you an illustration of what they're thinking might have been to some extent. There is another vaccine that's available, that is available in much larger quantities, but it has side effects. So that can be serious and even fatal in some cases. So for smallpox, which is incredibly deadly, I'm their thinking may have been that, well, we have this other vaccine for the smallpox threat. It's not ideal, but we have that. And this vaccine, which has few, if any, significant side effects, you know, is preferable. But you know, we have we have a little cushion here for smallpox. I don't think they were thinking monkeypox. I mean, again, because people don't want to use the vaccine with the potentially fatal side effects for monkeypox. So I'm not making a defense of what 
their thought process was, but they were mainly focused on smallpox. And they did have a backup for smallpox, just not for monkeypox. Well, uh, if you know, and I understand uh, now I'm deep in the weeds here, uh, digging pretty deep, but um, you know, with a three-year expiration on the smallpox drugs, um, uh, you know, 2013 at three years, that gets us to 2016. What's been happening the last six years? Uh, have we made any progress on the ability to freeze and retain uh, effective uh, treatments or are we sort of right back where we were almost a decade ago? So, so I can't really authoritatively answer that question. This sort of, sort of goes beyond my expertise. I did as much research as I could on the issue and learned about this freeze-dry technology and that that was supposed to be the, uh, the answer. And the, uh, the sources I went to suggested that it hadn't uh, been perfected yet. I'm sure there's progress. I can't tell you how much. All right. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, you know, I understand the, uh, the dynamic that you described. That's a helpful clarification uh, for me. I, I do have to say that, um, you know, coming on the heels of our experience with COVID and the difficulty in uh, acquiring testing uh, in the early days, uh, and I think there's actually a lot to be, you know, impressed by around the development of a vaccine. Uh, but, um, you know, just as I say, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't suggest a lot of uh, confidence in the federal public health infrastructure. I'll just let it go at that. Supervisor Lee, comments or questions uh, on MPOX before we ask Mr. Margolin to move on to COVID to wrap things up? Yes, so um, just really, just the bottom line is, uh, when, when do we think that this genial vaccine will be made more widely available for us in Santa Clara County at this point, given the timeline and choice that you're seeing right now? So they are shipping vaccine um, with this recommendation to potentially slice it into fifths, two states right now for distribution. Um, this is really a question for Dr. Cody and the public health department because local public health departments are working with the state public health department on distribution. But I, but I know as we speak, there is vaccine distribution going on in expanded supply. Short of the need, but expanded supply is being provided. Supervisor Lee, let me see if uh, Dr. Smith can uh, weigh in here. Uh, perhaps not, but I, I'll uh, pause to see if that's uh, something about which he has updated information. Um, can you hear me still? Loud and clear. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Okay. Yeah, the um, distribution um, to all of the counties in California, except for LA, is coming through the state based on a formula. And the distribution from the feds to the states is uh, also based on a formula. So we're getting roughly 2,000 doses every two to three weeks lately, although there's promises that it will be increased. Um, if that's the rate of increase, uh, it'll take us many months to get uh, sufficient dosages to cover um, the county. Um, that's why we're focused on um, expanding the number of doses by using the five to one ratio for subdermal. And uh, um, we're also uh, focusing on the risk relations. But <clears throat> quickly, I think um, we will start running into similar problems that we had with uh, um, COVID because as the numbers go up in the county, right now there are only about 90, 95 cases, but as they get up into the, you know, couple hundreds or a uh, couple or thousands, um, I'm sure that the general public, different from the focus population, will generate uh, much more demand. And uh, I'm anticipating our demand will outstrip our capacity um, and this time around we don't have the benefit of 
the feds distributing the uh, vaccine um, with HRSA, so we won't have that advantage. And, uh, you know, we all are going to be dependent upon federal uh, distribution. There won't be a, a private market for the vaccine, at least for the foreseeable future. So mm -hmm. um, that's a bad message, but I think two to three months from now, we're in trouble. All right. And then how about the, um, uh, sorry, uh, just a follow-up question on the uh, other one. You, you mentioned, I believe it's called ACAM2000, is the uh, other vaccine that has uh, more side effects and, and, and contraindications than the Genio vaccine, right? Um, has, has there been any word from federal government, government about what, about the distribution of ACAM2000 as well, since we have so much of it? Question was directed. Is that for me? I think it is directed to you, Dr. Smith. Yes. Um, wow. Um, I'm certainly not an expert in this, but from what my understanding is, is that it's still not recommended and there's no EUA approval for um, it. And there, there's not likely going to be one because of the side effect profile. Um, I do believe that. Other researchers are working on uh, modifications of vaccine to try to come up with something that will be another effective vaccine without all the side effects. But I think that's you know some time off. All right. Okay. So we're not allowed to use it yet at this point, basically. Thank you. All, all right. right, Mr. Margolin, back to you, and uh, let's move on to. Uh, COVID uh, status at the and information at the national level that uh, would be relevant to our work here in the county, if you can, please. So, so on this issue, I don't have a lot to report and actually would like to maybe defer a full report to the Health and Hospital Committee next week on this issue. I think I focus mainly on the monkeypox question for today. But the one thing I would say is that there was an effort earlier in the year to get supplemental federal funding for vaccine acquisition and all the other work that needs to be done to prepare for the next round of um, the next round of, of vaccinations uh, in the fall that will ultimately uh, that ultimately are coming and what the what the Biden administration did since they couldn't get the supplemental dollars approved in any of these packages is they ended up uh, cannibalizing other funds and shifting monies around in various ways and they, they are working on uh, preparing for the fall with, uh, with, with the resources that they think they'll need. And they did it through uh, diverting money from other purposes. And again, I can give you a fuller account of all this uh, next week if that's uh, acceptable to you. That'd be just fine. I, <coughs> I am inferring and I wanna make sure my inference is correct <coughs> that since there's been no mention, there is no mention and perhaps uh, Mr. Peter, Ms. Powell can weigh in, uh, no one's, uh, no one's talking out loud about the fact that uh, the COVID challenge is uh, staying with us longer than anticipated, that there continue to be some economic impacts, both uh, in the private and public sector. And uh, there, I don't hear any buzz about yet another uh, relief bill coming uh, that involves funds for state or local government. Am I? That's correct. There was a push to get more relief money into these, these recent packages and uh, they, those pushes failed and there's no relief money on the horizon as of, as of now. All right. Yeah, I would just add to that. Um, the objection came from some of the Republicans in the Senate. They wanted the COVID supplemental to be offset or fully paid for um, and they couldn't get an agreement on that. There was also talk about adding it to the appropriations bills um, that I think some of the Senate Dem leadership was looking at, but at this juncture, it's not it's not clear or it doesn't look likely that either of those are going to be paths that um, are going to produce the fruit. All right, thank you very much. We, with the understanding that we'll defer some of this conversation uh, with Mr. Margolin at least to our uh, next health and hospital meeting. Uh, Supervisor Lee, comments or questions for any of our team here? Uh, no further. Thank you. All right. Then um, 
Uh, let me just confirm with the clerk. We have no uh, members of the public teed up to speak on item six or seven. That is confirmed, sir. All right, thank you. And uh, uh, let me go back to Mr. Mead, Ms. Powell, anything else that uh, you all would like to share with our team today? I don't have anything to add. Thank you though. All right. And Mr. Margolin, are we good to go? Uh, we are, yes. All right, then I'm gonna ask uh, Supervisor Lee for a motion to receive the reports in item six and seven, both. I don't think that'll be confusing for the clerk. Uh, but then at least we'll have a formal motion on the record. And if we get that motion, I'll second it. And so moved. All right. Motion by Lee, second by Simidian. All those, uh, let's go call the roll. I was going to say all those in favor, but I think we need to call the roll. Go to it, uh, Clerk. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Item Thank six you. and seven are formally acted upon. Uh, we have taken care of the minutes on the consent calendar. So that means it is time to adjourn. Uh, to our next regularly scheduled meeting, which at present, and it's always subject to change, uh, is slated for October the 5th of this year. I'll say thank you again to everyone, a lot going on, uh, and uh, very much appreciate uh, your helping us uh, uh, chart the course here. Without objection, hearing none, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Recording stopped.